us on this summery evening anyway. It's wonderful to have you here. Uh, we've got about an hour together now to think about 30 by 30, and it's goes without saying that 30 by 30 is a really, really important environmental commitment. It's now underlined in the Global Biodiversity Framework as one of the key goals that unite the world in thinking about how we turn around the ongoing chronic decline of biodiversity. And here in the UK, we are three years into our 30 by 30 commitment, three years into what was originally a decade long, very exciting mission as part of what became a commitment under the Environment Act to halt and begin to reverse the decline of biodiversity by 2030. It was an excellent commitment when it was made and it was world leading when it was made. It goes, um, it's worth saying that the UK played a leading role in diplomacy around international efforts to get behind 30 by 30. And the UK government was one of the governments that moved fastest and furthest in making bold commitments to protect 30% of the land and sea for nature. If you can feel a butt coming on, it's because three years into that decade long mission, we are definitely not three years in, in terms of progress on hitting the 30 by 30 target. So Link has been reporting annually on progress on 30 by 30. And this year we're disappointed to report that there's been next to no progress on 30 by 30 in the terrestrial and freshwater environment, next to no progress on 30 by 30 in the marine environment, and very little progress in terms of the policy underpinnings that will help us to get towards 30 by 30. So the score that you'll find in the report that's published on our website and which we'll post in the chat in a moment, is that we are just over 3% of the land effectively protected and well managed for nature. The score you'll find is actually slightly lower than last year. That's because, as Emma will explain shortly, we actually know more about the condition of those sites on land than we did before. And what that improved information is revealing is that more sites are in poorer condition than we'd previously thought, so fewer qualify for 30 by 30. At sea, we've given roughly the same score as last year, 8% effectively protected. And through the report, you'll find a description of the policy underpinnings that will help us to get to 30 by 30, because if you're a policymaker, you may say, hey, hold on. And this would be fair enough. It takes time, doesn't it, for the natural world to respond. Of course, it's going to take a little while as we get into 30 by 30 to start to see the results of action. That's why we think it's really important to, to start to monitor the pipeline of places that might be suitable for inclusion in 30 by 30 and progress on the policy framework that will help us to get there. And you'll find in the report this year a, a catalogue of missed opportunities that the government could have taken to get us on the way towards 30 by 30. Think, for example, of that critical piece in the jigsaw puzzle of 30 by 30 that is our national parks and AONBs, those great protected landscapes that were created uh, uh, just after the, the bombs stopped falling after the Second World War. Those great landscapes that have so much potential to work for nature, but at the moment, unfortunately, aren't in good condition for nature. The government had an opportunity to improve those landscapes for nature and improve the way they're managed. So far, it's resisted those opportunities. Think, for example, at sea of the highly protected marine area programme, where we've had a really bold commitment uh, to, to roll out highly protected marine areas, but we've seen only the first hints of, of implementation with only, only a handful of sites coming forward. So. Uh, Unfortunately, we could go on with those lists of missed opportunities. A third, just to quickly mention, is the watering down of the environmental land management pr proposals, which are so crucial for driving improvements in the quality of the protected site network. If that were it, you might say, well, don't worry, look to the environmental improvement programme. There are um, hints in there of how things will improve. But if there's one message that we've tried to say consistently year on year for 30 by 30, it's do no harm and don't make things worse. When last we met, the great looming threat was the retained EU Law Act, 
which has now been enacted and has given the government powers that could very easily be used to weaken environmental law. But it can't have escaped many people's attention that right now we're facing another threat that could undermine the integrity of some of those few sites that already qualify for 30 by 30. In our view, it's triple SIs, sites of special scientific interest, SPAs, special protection areas, and SAC, special areas of conservation, uh, under the habitats regulations that actually count towards 30 by 30. And just in this last few days, the government's brought forward proposals in the levelling up bill to do away with rules around nutrient neutrality. These rules, if you haven't followed them, are rules that make sure that new developments can't add to the awful cocktail of pollution that are already affecting our rivers. So think, for example, of agricultural pollution. Think, for example, of wastewater pollution. The nutrient neutrality rules are there to make sure that development can only go ahead when there is sufficient mitigation in place to ensure that you're not adding to that toxic pollution load. It doesn't stop houses from being built, but it makes sure that when they are, there's mitigation in place. But now the government is ripping up its own scheme and proposing to get rid of nutrient neutrality. That would be a short term boost for the speed of housing development, but the sacrifice would be the long term integrity of the habitats regulations and added pollution on top of that that our rivers are already facing in our most important areas of protection for wildlife. So if you haven't followed that campaign, please watch out for uh, votes that are likely to come before the House of Lords this time next week in the levelling up bill that give an opportunity to stop the government in its tracks before it weakens those few laws that really do contribute so far to 30 by 30. On a day like this, it would be unfortunate, wouldn't it, to finish on a, a gloomy note. And I guess it's worth saying that uh, we are at a very sensitive point in the political cycle. There's likely to be a general election coming. And now is the opportunity for political parties to start a race to the top in terms of protection. And that's why at Wildlife and Countryside Link, with lots of the partners on the call and lots of the partners represented in the 30 by 30 report, you'll see a new Nature 2030 campaign, which has set out five ways that the political parties could go about creating stronger policies to help us to meet that uh, 2030 goal of halting the decline of wildlife. And amongst them, you'll find a 30 by 30 rapid delivery plan, which includes expanding the area of protection under the habitats regulations and as triple SIs, improving the quality of those sites, improving national parks and AOMBs for the way they're managed for nature, and creating the idea of a new public nature estate. So uh, creating new places held in public ownership for the legacy of our natural environment to be managed well for nature for the future. We think those are exciting ideas that all the parties should be considering for their manifestos. We've already begun to have excellent conversations with some parties about them. If you think they're good ideas too, please watch out for the Nature 2030 campaign and add your name because it's really, really important that at this stage we don't let the, the idea, the flame of 30 by 30 die because of fading hopes of delivery. We need to be out there with solutions to help the government get there. So with those ideas in mind, I'm really pleased to welcome a, uh, an ACE panel of speakers to talk through our 30 by 30 findings in more detail. First, we'll be turning to two of Link's biggest brains who've uh, been uh, working hard on the report. So uh, Emma Clark, Senior Policy Officer who looks after our planning and development work. Matt Dawson, Senior Policy Officer who looks after our marine and waste working groups. So we'll turn to those guys first. Then we're delighted to be joined by Dr. Rose O'Neill, who is the Chief Executive of the Campaign for National Parks, and by Carolyn Caroline Cotterell, who is the Programme Director for Resilient Landscapes and Seas at Natural England, who'll be offering some of her own reflections on the report and uh, her ideas about how 30 by 30 is progressing. So without further introduction, I'd like to turn to Emma to talk, talk us through some of the report's findings on terrestrial and the freshwater environment. Over to you, Emma. 
Thanks very much, Richard, for that introduction. Um, I'll be talking about, yeah, the terrestrial and freshwater half of the report. Um, I'll be explaining what we think the criteria are for 30 by 30 on land, how we analyze different aspects of land to come up with our figure, and how we think the, the government can make up this big gap between 3.11% currently effectively protected for nature on land and the 30% that we'd like to get to. So for our report, we developed two link criteria based on international standards a few years ago. These were one, that areas for 30 by 30 should be protected in the long term from harm, and two, there should be requirements for good management for nature. These might be of different variety types of management, but regular monitoring of these areas must demonstrate good or recovering ecological condition. In this report, we assess the different types of land in England against these two criteria to come up with a what land could currently count towards 30 by 30 in England, and two what areas meet the initial criteria protected and well managed for nature in the long term that could be considered in the pipeline towards 30 by 30 when eventually they demonstrate good or recovering condition. Currently, terrestrial protected sites, so that sites of special scientific interest, special areas of conservation, special protection areas, and Ramsar sites in England are the only designations that provide long-term protection and require good management for nature, meeting those two 30 by 30 criteria. When these sites are in favorable condition, we evaluate that they can't count towards the 30% target. As of mid-August, when we did this analysis, just 36.82% of triple SIs in England are in good condition, covering a total of 3.11% of England's land, which is where we got the overall land figure. This is down slightly from 38% of triple SIs in good condition last year, but this is due to updated monitoring from Natural England, which we'd really like to welcome. We first need a sense of where our protected sites are at before we can ensure that man good management is in place to recover those areas for nature. We have not included triple SIs classed as unfavorable and recovering, another 49% of triple SIs, in our assessment because currently sites that are classed as recovering this simply means in some cases that they have a management plan in place. Many sites have been recorded as recovering for years, but have shown no real improvement in condition and may have even declined. To achieve 30 by 30, we need to get more of these most protected sites for nature into good or genuinely recovering ecological condition. We certainly can't afford to weaken site protection rules for these sites, for example, the government's proposals on nutrient neutrality. And we need to significantly expand the protected sites network to cover more of the most important places for habitats and wildlife in England. Turning to a second type of land designation, we have protected landscapes, national parks and AONBs, which cover vast areas of England and some of the most important areas for nature. But unfortunately, Nature within protected sites in these landscapes is often in poor condition than nature in the surrounding countryside. No areas of national parks and AONBs that are not already designated as triple SIs currently meet the criteria and would count towards the 30% target. The government itself acknowledged this in its response to the Glover Review in 2021. They said national parks and AONBs cannot be said to contribute to 30 by 30 under their current statutory purposes, level of protection and level of management. So we've thought out what is needed to support nature recovery in these landscapes to enable large portion of national parks and AONBs to meet the 30 by 30 criteria and contribute to the target and nature recovery in England. National parks need stronger management plans with specific targets and actions for nature's recovery, and there needs to be stronger duties on public bodies that operate within these landscapes, for example, water companies, to contribute to the delivery of these management plans. Uh, but I will leave our national parks expert, Rose, to speak more about the upcoming legislative opportunity to do this. 
The point is that national parks and AONBs could be supported to meet 30 by 30 criteria and contribute big portions, ideally more than 30%, given their vast potential for climate and nature as compared to the surrounding landscape. Finally, other effective area-based conservation measures, or OECMs for short, are another tool that could be used to identify and support important areas for nature to deliver good biodiversity outcomes. For example, these could be sites already identified and designated, um, but without legal underpinning. So for example, local wildlife sites um, national nature reserves not already underpinned by a triple SI designation and local nature reserves. This could also include land owned and managed for nature by environmental organizations. And we actually have a few great case studies in the report. Thank you very much to our network for sharing those with us. It could also include land owned and managed for other purposes. So for example, the primary purpose might be defense or water management but where long-term conservation of biodiversity is also achieved on these areas. An OECM is, is not a blanket designation, but these areas could be assessed on a case-by-case -case basis against international OECM standards, recognized as an OECM, that they are genuinely delivering good biodiversity outcomes, and then they could be counted towards 30 by 30. This is an important tool in the government's 30 by 30 um, toolbox, and they must consult and publish criteria for potential OECMs. So we can start to identify these areas and put more sites for nature into a pipeline to contribute to 30 by 30 when delivering good biodiversity outcomes. I guess in conclusion, I'd like to yeah, acknowledge that we are a long way from 30 by 30 on land, and this report is quite honest about where we think the government has gotten to. But there are ways to get there, and it's really important to create this thriving network of the best places for nature across 30% of England's land, supported by nature-friendly practices across the other 70% because we need to achieve nature's recovery, including the legally binding targets under the Environment Act and 30 by 30 will be essential to that. We need to identify and support more of the most important sites for nature, get them into good protection and management and help them deliver good biodiversity outcomes. Urgent action now, Again, I would urge you to sign the Nature 2030 petition, which calls for a rapid delivery project for 30 by 30. And I think we can achieve 30 by 30 on land in England. Thank you. Thank you so much, Emma. Extremely clearly put, um, including an extremely uh, a clear articulation of what OECM stands for without uh, once stumbling over the words, which is impressive in itself. Um, we'll turn from the land straight to the sea, if we may. So over to you, Matt. And just to note, by the way, folks, that there is a, a Q&A function in the bar at the bottom, which some people have already found. Please feel free to um, leave post questions in there as we go, and we'll turn to those um, shortly. Over to you, Matt. Thanks so much. Thanks, Richard. So our analysis has found that in 2023, a maximum of 8% of English seas could be said to be protected for nature against the most damaging forms of fishing activity, which we know is a primary driver of marine biodiversity loss. The three different forms of marine protection that we've analysed to get to our 8% figure, these are highly protected marine areas, HPMAs, offshore marine protected areas, and inshore MPAs. So firstly, the HPMAs, which now protect 0.5% of our seas, and that's an improvement over last year. These are a new designation which restrict all damaging human activities across the sites. It's a really welcome step forward, and it means that sites at Allenby Bay in Cumbria, Dolphin Head in the English Channel, and northeast of Farns Deep in the North Sea now provide new places where marine life can properly recover and thrive. So secondly, there's 5.5% of our seas in offshore MPAs where bottom trawling is now restricted. There's currently a program being delivered by the Marine Management Organization to restrict damaging fishing activity in all of our offshore MPAs by the end of next year. It's so far protected four sites, which is what's reflected in our figures. 
However, it's disappointing that it seems to have stalled and there's been no new sites protected in the last 12 months. Although we are expecting 13 additional MPA sites to be brought forward shortly. So the percentage figure um, is the proportion of the sites protected. And we should note that frustratingly, some of the sites that are brought forward through the programme are only protected over their designated features rather than the whole of the site. And our figure reflects that. Thirdly, there's the 2% of our seas which are inshore MPAs where bottom toe fishing gear restrictions are in place. So taken together, it's around 8% of English seas that could be said to be protected for nature against the most damaging fishing activity. However, there is a caveat that we're making clear in this report that unfortunately it's almost certainly an overestimate of where we are. The area protected for nature at sea is in the marine protected area network um, where there are fishing restrictions in place. However, there's numerous other pressures such as developments, such as new oil and gas pollution and other fishing methods which will likely continue to damage and degrade these important sites. One of the examples that we look at in the report is the Dogger Bank MPA, which does have a site-wide ban on bottom trawling, which is a really positive development. Yet, within the boundary of the MPA, analysis of oil and gas activity by Oceana and Uplift has shown that there's 176 wells, 13 platforms, and a network of 633 kilometers of associated pipelines. This is in addition to other existing and planned developments, including wind farms, telecoms cables, and carbon dioxide storage license areas. So we cannot be complacent, even with the best protected MPAs, as there's still a lot that needs to be done to ensure that they fully deliver for nature. And that's why we're calling on the government to deliver a suite of ambitious marine policies to achieve 30 by 30 goals. We set out some recommendations, which include, firstly, that it's vital that the new bylaws are brought forward through the MMO programme against damaging fishing activity. These should be across the whole of the offshore MPA network by the end of 2024. MPAs must be protected across the whole of the site rather than just on the designated features. Secondly, the government should designate as an absolute minimum 10% of English seas in those HPMAs, the highly protected marine areas. It's vital that this HMA programme continues to protect new sites beyond the initial three. Our percentage figure for HPMAs would have actually been higher for this year if two sites hadn't been dropped by ministers earlier in the year. The two rejected sites covered an additional, additional 191 kilometres squared of valuable marine habitats. The scaling back of the programme was particularly disappointing as it won't now currently deliver the five sites which the initial Benyon review into HPMAs recommended as the bare minimum to make the programme a success. Thirdly, the government should deliver a new system of marine spatial planning, which assesses the carrying capacity of English seas and prioritises the achievement of nature and climate targets, including through the protection of MPAs and the successful delivery of 30 by 30. And finally, policies needed to address bycatch and a lack of fisheries monitoring through the mandatory use of technologies such as remote electronic monitoring with cameras on all vessels in English waters. This should be delivered much faster than the government's current proposals and cover all boats, including those smaller boats. So to conclude, government action has stalled this year in the marine environment and at around 8% protected, we remain a good way off the 30 by 30 goals. As our seas continue to face Old threats such as overfishing and new ones such as extreme marine heat waves. It's important the government steps up to get us back on track for 30 by 30. Thank you so much, Matt. And it's, it was one of the issues, wasn't it, early on that uh, the extent of MPAs at sea gives the impression of uh, a huge network of protection. But as you've just brilliantly described, uh, oftentimes that belies the truth where lots of damaging activities can continue. So it's really good to, to be thinking about filling in that map. I'd just like to pause for a moment before we turn to Rose, because Bill has posed a really important question in the chat. Um, Bill asks, why is no account given in our assessments a high nature value land that's privately managed by farmers or other, other landowners? So um, I'll turn to, to Emma to tackle that question because we 
absolutely are mindful of the huge contribution that farmers do and can make even more to turning around the decline of, of wildlife. So over to you, Emma. Thanks, Richard. And thank you for this. Yeah, great question. I think it's really important. There are tons of really high value nature sites that are privately managed and to ensure they're recognized through 30 by 30 is really important. In our minds, the best tool to do this is through those OECMs or other effective area-based conservation measures, which are essentially a non-legal mechanism to recognize that an area is under long-term management and delivering good biodiversity outcomes for nature. We want the government to publish these criteria um, that are aligned with the international OECM criteria and a clear accreditation process so that landowners can look at those criteria, assess their land against that and get recognized for their great work. So for example, this might be land that is owned and in a landscape recovery project scheme that is long-term, so at least 30 years um, or more, that is regularly monitored and delivering good biodiversity outcomes equivalent to that of a protected area. So the 30% is really the best bits for nature and lots of those are outside the protected sites network and we need to find a way to recognize and accredit those areas to contribute to the target as well. Thank you so much, uh, Emma, that's that's really clear. Uh, and I, it's, it's the long-term bit that's crucial. So you can have some fantastic but ephemeral uh, habitat in the farmed environment that's absolutely essential for biodiversity, but doesn't meet the 30 by 30 criteria of long-term protection and positive management. And one of the things you'll find in the Nature 2030 proposals is that we're calling for a doubling of the budgets for wildlife friendly farming to make sure that people are properly rewarded for that. And in particular, we think that the situation at the moment where triple S, private owners of triple SIs can be punished for harming the triple SI, but there's no special scheme in place to reward them for positive management isn't right. And we'd like to see a really uh, strong incentive for private landowners who own a triple SI, for example, to be rewarded even more handsomely to get it into good condition because that's of such public value and as such a contribution to this agenda. So thanks, Emma, and thanks, Bill, for the great question. We'll turn uh, now to Rose, if we may. So uh, Rose, the Chief Executive of the Campaign for National Parks. Hi, Richard. Thank you. Um, and thanks to Link and congratulations on the great report, Emma and Matt. Um, so I'm going to start with the disclaimer that I really love protected landscapes. So our national parks and our AMBs cover about a quarter of England. And these should be the places where most of the land is delivering for 30 by 30. But as Emma really clearly pointed out, currently they just don't. And as Richard said, there's been no progress. And in fact, since last year, we have gone backwards in many ways. But, um, and positive side, there is real opportunity for massive gains with relatively small and uncontroversial efforts in our protected landscape. So um, I've just come back from a family holiday in Dartmoor, which was not a requirement of our of my job description. But, uh, you know, the landscape there is absolutely breathtaking, even on a, a soggy day. And we walked through, you know, deep granite gorges, ancient woodlands along sparkling rivers and through the purple and yellow of, of heather and gorse and up to the endless views at the top of those high tours. And those were the moments that really revive us and, and keep us focused on, on f fighting and for, for nature. Um, and also the moments that really result in the public really getting behind and wanting these changes. So wanting wild and national parks, wanting these protections in place. Um, but in that moment at the top of that tour, there was melancholy for me too, because surely, surely in these last wildernesses that we have in Britain, these should be the places where nature is thriving. They should be buzzing and humming and vibrant with, with wildlife, but they're not. They are silent. They are bereft. And as Emma said, they're falling behind. So only a quarter of triple SIs in the national parks are in favourable condition compared to about a third in, in, in for the whole of England. 
And across our protected landscapes, there are wells extracting millions and millions of tonnes of oil. And there are highways authorities planning major roads across sensitive habitat. And there's industrial forestry and conifer plantations on, on peatlands and heath. And there are water companies. And I don't know if anyone saw the BBC breakfast this morning, but, you know, it was shown vividly that there's pumping out enormous tonnes of sewage into our most iconic waterways in these landscapes. So do they, does that sound like a place effectively managed for nature? No. And all those environmental disasters are in the hands of public bodies. And they're all counter um, to the advice of the National Park Authorities and um, Natural England. And so I haven't even mentioned the role of intensive land management like burning um, on privately owned land. Um, although even there, um, as Richard said, the public bodies can influence behaviour. And so this all comes down to the fact that national parks and AOMBs are not sufficiently powered to recover nature. So yes, national parks have a statutory purpose to conserve and enhance wildlife, but that is not working, that's not enough. And as Emma said, there are two key tests in terms of what counts for 30 by 30. So are areas being sufficiently managed and monitored to demonstrate nature's recovery? And is there effective governance in place to secure protection in that long term? And we know that across the protected landscapes, there's a paucity of data on the state of nature. And that's linked to the fact that the governance needed for that long term protection is not in place yet. But, but unlike in lots of England, the institutional infrastructure to do that is there. So to get this right, to tweak it, um, to build that pipeline to focus on what we have in place now should be a relatively easy win for 30 by 30. And that's what the change in the law proposed by Lord Randall to the levelling up bill, which is going to be debated in the Lords in the coming days. That's what that change is trying to achieve. And it's not a silver bullet, but it's a change that's uncontroversial and widely supportive. So NGOs and scientists and park authorities and AMBs and Natural England and the Gov Review and until relatively recently, the government itself. So the change that he's proposing is to strengthen the um, statutory management plans and directly link those plans to legal targets. So at the moment, there is a legal duty only really to publish a plan. There's no requirement of any an ambition and there's no need to actually deliver it. Um, so we want to strengthen those plans. And crucially, crucially, we want to um, require public bodies like the Forestry um, England, like highways, authorities, councils, water companies. We want to require those bodies to no longer pretty much ignore the protected landscapes and their purposes and plans, but to further them. And this simple change is the first thing, you know, the simplest things that government ministers can do, you know, next week to st hugely strengthen um, protected landscapes for 30 by 30. And beyond that, whoever forms the next government, we want to see um, a 30 by 30 rapid delivery project, as Richard said, that's one of the key asks of the Nature 2030 um, campaign. And that includes uh, new incentives and, and obligations on protected sites and landscapes to deliver more. Um, it puts in place more powers for national parks and AMBs, including reforms to their decision-making boards and put in place controls on more damaging activities. And we do want to see more designations, but most importantly, it's the governance and the monitoring and the powers and the investment to get what we have now designated. Um, well, and uh, to, to, to get what we have designated now, managed for nature. So these essential reforms are very, very doable, and they could enable national parks and AMBs to um, become major contributors to 30 by 30. So we really strongly advise the government to get behind them. And if you haven't done so yet, please sign up to the Nature 2030 campaign to um, get behind them too. Brilliant, thank you, Rose. I, I thought your sort of positive Arcadian description of your holiday versus the sort of uh, apocalyptic description of, of pollution and, and mining and drilling uh, summed up perfectly how that these places could be could be wonderful but all too often those day-to-day -day decisions that the authorities themselves think should go one way unfortunately keep going the other way and, and you said this could change next week didn't you it's literally next week isn't it Uh, so, so yes, we're expecting a vote next Wednesday, I think, everybody. So if there's if you if you're in contact with peers or parliamentarians and want to give them a push, 
down the right lobby, then there's still time to win that one. Thank you so much, um, Rose. Uh, I can see there are some more questions popping up in the chat, so please do continue to use that function. Uh, but we'll turn now to, to Caroline. Um, Caroline joins us from, from Natural England. Uh, Natural England have been doing some fantastic work thinking about how 30 by 30 can be uh, brought into effect. And of course, they are the ones who are out there um, thinking about the monitoring and good management of protected site network. I think it's fair to say Natural England have had difficulties with budget cuts over the last 10 years that have meant that some of the monitoring uh, and enforcement that we would have liked to see to get that condition and those management plans improving has struggled. Uh, some of those budget cuts have now been reversed, but there's a long way to go still in those core statutory functions to get, uh, get our protected site network up to scratch. And I know that Natural England is, is eager to get on the case. So Caroline, thank you for coming and being with us and listening to those points from the team. It would be fantastic to hear your reflections on uh, whether you think um, the, the report is an accurate reflection of reality. Uh, and it would be great to hear from you where Natural England is thinking lies about how we can make sure that we make the most of this next seven years to get to the 30 by 30 target. Thank you, Richard. And um, thank you, Link, actually, also for, for the report uh, and the profile that you're continuing to give this hugely important international commitment. Um, because I doubt anyone who's on this call is going to underestimate the scale of the challenge that effectively managing and protecting 30% of our land and seas by 2030 presents. The greater clarity we can have over that vision and a shared understanding of what it means and the benefits that are going to flow from achieving it, the greater the public support is going to be for the actions that are going to be necessary to achieve it. So thank you for keeping this kind of commitment front and centre amongst many other important other commitments and, and noise that's out there as well. So. I'm actually going to steal from John Watkins from the National Association of AOMBs, who, was, who I was in a meeting with. And um, John said about 30 by 30, we don't want to hit the target and miss the point. And for me, that just beautifully summed up what we are trying to achieve here. We must not make 30 by 30 an accounting exercise. We need to really focus on driving those environmental outcomes that government has set out in legislation, in the EIP, and we also need our approach to delivering 30 by 30 to really build the support of farmers, landowners, fishers, businesses, communities who are all going to be absolutely central to this. So, Richard, I thought I'd just reflect on kind of four areas in, in the report very briefly. And the first, as you might expect, is around the recommendations on triple SIs and the need for in, improved monitoring and uh, redefining kind of how we, how we regard something as kind of recovering. And completely agree with what you set out there, Emma. Um, we have had some increased resource in the last couple of years, which is really welcome. And with that, Natural England has been able to relaunch a monitoring program for triple SIs. By the end of this year, we will have just under a quarter, about 22% of triple SI features will have an up-to-date condition assessment and we'll have set out our plan for how we're going to meet the government's commitment for all features to have an assessment by 2028. That plan, yes, we're going to make increasing use of technology, draw on the expertise of partners and landowners, but the report is absolutely right to highlight that that is going to need further and sustained funding um, to, be, to achieve it. Uh, because those condition assessments are just so critical for help us, helping us identify the actions that are going to be necessary to maintain and bring sites into favourable condition to address the sort of issues that, that Rose was highlighting. So going forward, and this apologies that this may sound technical, but um, picks up on a comment Emma made, um, we are only going to be considering a triple SI as being in unfavourable recovering uh, condition where it's got an up-to-date assessment and none of those actions are that we've identified are necessary are behind schedule. So just having a plan is no longer going to be enough. We're going to publish that approach in the autumn. And we think that this combination of up-to-date assessments, 
and with actions on track mean that we will be able to confidently include both triple SIs in favourable condition and those that we know are on track to recovering as part of 30 by 30. Um, second area I want to touch on is protected landscapes and as Rosa has said you know this is such an important time for AOMBs and national parks at the moment. We're supporting DEFRA with some um, ambitious pieces of work to set targets for the environmental outcomes that protected landscapes need to deliver. Uh, we're refreshing management plan guidance and um, it is literally the draft of our management plan guidance is out for consultation. So a quick plug, I'd encourage you all to feed into that. It's literally out uh, over the last couple of days. Because um, we want to do everything we can to help protected landscapes punch above their weight on 30 by 30. As we agree with the report and as Rose articulated, you know, whilst these are protected areas under IUCN classification, they cannot be said to be delivering entirely in their areas for nature currently. We know that protected landscape bodies want to do more for nature, but as Rose has just really powerfully advocated, um, they need those extra levers to help them achieve that. The third area I wanted to just reflect on was OECMs. Um, and I do think that the opportunity that OECMs present here could be absolutely transformational. You know, it really could finally give recognition to areas of land that we know have so much potential for nature, but are frequently overlooked, whether that's your local nature reserves or the farmer clusters doing kind of great landscape scale restoration. We're exploring the role that Natural England can have in that, um, both locally, for example, through advising on local nature recovery strategies um, to help bring forward the pipeline of, of potential areas, as well as nationally in terms of assessment and reporting. But I do think there's a real potential game changer for us in OECMs that could really help us achieve um, a step change in nature, nature recovery. And then finally, the picture at sea, as we've heard from Matt, is, is really quite different. You know, technically we have, uh, we've already met 30% of our area of seas are in protected areas. So the task here, as we see it, is very much about making sure that those areas are really effectively managed and conserved um, and ensuring that the, the wider sustainable use that goes on in those areas as well is fully consistent with their nature recovery objectives. So we're looking at that with DEFRA, how we can help that through things such as improving evidence on marine protected areas and conditions, but also it's gonna need looking at how we increase this, the scope of protection and that the wider kind of ecosystem benefits and services that marine protected areas um, deliver are captured and reflected in marine spatial planning. So um, a, a lot there we would support. So I think, I, I wanted to reflect those because I think they indicate some of the positive steps that are being made. But um, as as Richard and others have said, you know, 2030 is going to be on us really quickly, isn't it? Um, and so whilst we may not agree with every detail in the report, and there are some things where we would take a different view, I think we do absolutely agree on that urgent need for action. Um, if 30 by 30 is going to succeed, it is going to have to lead to more, bigger, more connected places for nature. It would be possible to achieve 30 by 30 just through a series of kind of isolated sites. You know, we end up with a complete measle map of uh, protected areas and OECMs. So just to return to John Watkins's kind of comment again, you know, I think if we can make and set 30 by 30 in the context of a nature recovery network. So we're connecting these sites, we're buffering these sites, we're creating the conditions within which nature can flourish, people can benefit, then we're really gonna hit the point of 30 by 30 and that's what we need to focus on. Well, if there's ever such a good thing, uh, such a thing, Caroline, that was a good theft to borrow that phrase because um, uh, John's absolutely right and you, expanded on that point brilliantly that this isn't an exercise in finding places to include it's an exercise in improving and protecting places so that they can be included and it's that leverage that makes the the difference and I, I wonder um there are lots of different ways to to reach 30 by 30 aren't there you could uh, go down the route of protected sites you could go down the route of 
uh, OECMs. You could really focus on improving condition and probably it's a mix of all of those. Has Natural England set out those scenarios for governance? And do you, for example, do you have a view on how much of an increase in the protected site network might be needed to, to give that backbone of, uh, of 30 by 30? We are working with DEFRA to look at uh, different scenarios that could, but different kind of what different places could potentially contribute. The important bit being that we're we're capturing and extending the areas that are important for nature. Um, the the question over the extent of the kind of core designated areas, the triple SIs, and the call in the report um, to double the triple SI network is one I do think we need to treat with care. Natural England continues to implement its published designation pipeline, and we will continue to do that. But I think we do need to be careful about how we take people with us on the journey by 30 to 30 by 30, coming right back to kind of one of my first points about, you know, how we deliver 30 by 30 will be really important. And I think there is a real risk if we were going for an, uh, you know, a doubling of the land that is currently designated as triple SIs in a very short period of time, we risk alienating, I think, some of those people who are going to be so fundamental to achieving this. But equally, some of these other measures such as OECMs are going to be really central. They will still need to meet um, the international standards around being effectively managed and around being protected to contribute to 30 by 30. So I don't think designation is the only way forward. That's really helpful, thanks, Caroline. And one of the things that we we thought didn't go so so well was the engagement process that might have led to HPMA designations, for example. And it was uh, part of that failure of engagement and working with local communities to to figure out how it could work. That unfortunately seems to have caused a blocker there. So absolutely understand that, and and hope that ideas like better make payments for um, people who are in charge of a triple SI might help to, to, to bring people along with us on that journey. So thank you again, Caroline. That was tremendously helpful. We've got a number of questions in the, the chat now, so we'll turn to those um, if we may. Uh, Maxwell, it's it's wonderful to have you with us. Um, uh, I, I won't say to see you because we can't, but thank you for posing your question. Um, I'll just read this one out. So Maxwell Iamba from, from Sheffield Environment Movement asks, Systems that have produced the climate crisis have been affecting frontline communities for longer than most of us have known about. Have those in power decided to listen and learn from voices on the front line? Uh, is the 30 by 30 goal addressing this deficit? So that really speaks to the question you've, you've asked there, Caroline. Is 30 by 30 um, about recognising environmental injustice and can it help us to, to get over that inequity of the way that that environmental degradation affects people. Um, I don't know whether you, you've got any thoughts on that yourself, Caroline, and then I'll look for um, sort of winks from the, from the team. Gosh, what a really great question, Max, or well, challenging as ever. Um, this isn't gonna be a full answer, um, but I think we cannot address nature and climate separately. So 30 by 30 is intrinsically part of looking at how we respond um, and address some of the climate crisis as well as the nature crisis. And it has to be done as coming back to this point about taking people with us and making sure that the benefits of achieving 30 by 30 are felt throughout the whole of society. Rose talked about how being in the Dartmoor landscape was just so reinvigorating for mind, body and soul. Um, and we need those benefits to extend to the whole of society. That is where I think making sure 30 by 30 is the core of the nature recovery network. We've got people with access to green space within 15 minutes of, of where they live. Those sorts of, we need to see it as part of that wider um, picture of improving um, both nature, addressing climate and improving the benefits for people, all sort of society, who are, wherever they live. Um, that doesn't address some of the historic injustices, but I think going forward means that we're trying to take a, an approach to this that is really ensuring that this is to benefit all. Thank you, Caroline. Is anybody else winking? Emma looks like she's drawing a breath. 
Thanks, Richard. Um, and thanks, Maxwell and Caroline. Um, again, not a complete answer, but maybe to add something um, about how 30 by 30 and kind of that underpinning of a healthy natural environment and functioning ecosystems for all. One way we've been thinking about it is as those core of protected sites, a sort of a a canary in the coal mine. When those protected sites are not in good condition due to pollution, um, due to climate change, due to these other factors that are degrading the environment overall, it is often these protected sites um, which uh, at which these sort of environmental limits, these environmental tipping points are flagged um, and so there's things like water quality and air quality that are flagged when they're pushing protected sites into poor condition. Um, and I think we can use protected sites as one of the mechanisms amongst many others, I think, um, a legal right to a healthy natural environment um, as another ask or, or way to ensure that we're treating nature and, and people together. Brilliant. Thanks, Rose. And let's turn, oh, sorry, thanks, Emma. Let's turn quickly to Rose uh, and then we'll uh, keep going with questions. It's the old mute button. Get there. Thank you. So just to add to that, I was just thinking actually about the process of, of sort of what we don't want to do is sort of in a government behind closed doors just to draw, draw a map of 30 by 30 and then try and impose it because it won't work doing it that way. And I think that's what Caroline was saying as well with her last point and because that risks both alienating the people that don't want it done to them and also excluding lots of people because it might not be the the places where we need to do it for, for people so so I think that the process needs to be much more open and inclusive and I think over the last year since the last report we've seen I know there's been a lot of activity sort of inside government behind Globe stores on this but there hasn't really been a huge amount of engagement with with um, communities about that so I think that that and I know that's something that the international community is looking at in terms of um, 30 by 30 as well. And just a plug for national parks and AMBs, you know, because they are local in a place with staff that have connections and relationships with people. Again, it's about that infrastructure that's already in place to, to do a lot of that engagement work as well. Brilliant. Thank you, Rose. Um, Diana Wynn asks a really important question that may have a, a, a short answer, but I'm going to return to I was going to return to Emma, but while I read it, I'll see if she pops back up. Um, is the land owned and managed by charities such as the Wildlife Trust and the RSPB counted towards the 30%? Sorry to put you under pressure there, uh, Emma, over to you again. No, sorry about that. Um, sorry, I'm a little bit under the weather, so just uh, blowing my nose off camera. Um, yes, we would love for some of the land that is owned and managed by um, folks like the Wildlife Trusts and the RSPB to count towards the 30%. Um, we've got some great, great case studies in the report this year to illustrate how that could happen. So they'd have to meet the 30 by 30 criteria of protected and well-managed in the long term and monitoring demonstrates good biodiversity outcomes. So for example, um, the RSPB might manage some uh, areas of land that are already designated as triple SIs. Natural England is in charge of the monitoring and when those are in favorable or genuinely recovering condition, then they can count towards the 30%. When there's not that underpinning legal designation, then how an area of land meets those criteria of long-term protection and good management could be in different ways. So for example, a site could be um, owned or have a sufficiently long-term lease by an ENGO. If there's a good management plan for nature in place and there's a program of regular monitoring, that area of land could meet the OECM criteria, be accredited as an OECM and contribute to 30 by 30. Um, so one of the examples that we've highlighted in the report is Langford Lowfields RSPB Reserve, um, which is a great Midlands, sorry, a great wetlands project in the Midlands. Um, and I yeah, really urge you to go read about that work and others that's 
yeah, great work being done by the ENGOs that'd be brilliant to have recognized through 30 by 30. Thank you. Thank you, Emma. Um, and I think we're clear, aren't we, that not all of those places will count either. So, we, you know, we know that, for example, some of the National Trust properties that are mainly looked after for heritage probably won't, won't be suitable for 30 by 30. And in total, this will probably add a couple of percent through the OECMs. But, but we're on, on the case. And thank you for that great answer, Emma. Um, I just if We've only got a couple of minutes left and we won't go late. So I'd just like to quickly pose, uh, if this is a quick question, Freya Gadsden's Bolton's question to Matt, as renewable energy is something being pushed for by various groups, how are we going to urge policymakers to consider the development processes for wind farms? There's a lot in the news about onshore today, so please check out what's changing. Uh, Matt, maybe you could give us a view for offshore. Yes, so it's something that we've been looking at quite closely through the Link Network, and the concern at offshore is how are we going to manage our space going sea space going forward to deliver the country's goals for both 30 by 30 and 50 gigawatts of offshore wind and in short the current way that we manage it is very badly planned we don't have marine plans which take consideration of both the climate and nature crises and the solution is going to be having a much more planned approach to how we manage space at sea ideally looking at something like a 2050 plant and then working back from there based on what the carrying capacity of the sea will be for sustainable fisheries, for offshore wind goals and for nature's protection. So essentially it's getting away from the current kind of ad hoc system of development for offshore wind at sea, which probably isn't working for nature at the moment and it is causing slow development of the offshore wind farms themselves. It's creating a much more planned approach, it's putting climate and nature together, working out what our priorities are for the offshore area and yeah having a much more thought through approach that everybody can work with that puts forward our priorities like that brilliant thank you so much matt and thank you folks for your questions there's one more question in the chat which i think is mainly intended as a perhaps a rhetorical one but it's a good one to finish on sue sayer asks when are we going to realize that protecting nature protects ourselves and our economies and really that gets to the heart of 30 by 30 doesn't it I won't point that question at any one of the panelists because it's possibly an impossible one to answer but the point is that protect 30 by 30 isn't simply an endeavor in looking after nature it's an endeavor about looking after our society creating a resilient economy and one that works in harmony with nature and it's only by flying the flag for 30 by 30 that we're going to make that progress so thank you to everyone who's contributed to this report today please if you've enjoyed the webinar and you agree with us keep pressing the idea of 30 by 30 get behind nature 2030 get behind everybody who's out there campaigning to extend protection on land and at sea and in particular let's take that sioux sentiment and use it as we head towards the general election to let all the parties know that if they care about a thriving economy if they care about an equitable society if they care about a prosperous future then they have to care about nature and they have to make 30 by 30 part of that plan. Thank you so much for joining us today, folks. Um, look forward to seeing you soon. Uh, really appreciate your time. Good night. <laughs>